The proof that the Federal Reserve is becoming less aggressive has fueled the biggest cross-asset rally since November 2022, with stocks, bonds, and credit all on the rise. Assisted by the growing sense that the Fed's rate hike cycle is over and a weak employment report, the S&P 500 and Nasdaq marked their best week of 2023. The Russell 2000 saw its biggest weekly gain since June 2020. The largest short squeeze in equities in a year pushed a basket of most shorted stocks up by 13%. On Wednesday, the FOMC voted to keep interest rates at the highest level in 22 years for the second consecutive meeting. Chairman Powell stated it is an open question whether the Fed will need to raise rates again and that they will proceed cautiously, observing how the economy evolves. Powell's speech was interpreted dovish by investors, despite repeated assurances that decisions on future rate cuts are yet to be made and will depend on incoming data. The swap market now shows traders foresee only a 16% chance of another increase by January and are pricing in a cut by June instead of July. Although the slowdown in October hiring is good news, it's unlikely the central bank will react excessively to just one month of data. Officials' opinions on the need for a new hike will also depend on inflation reports. Long-term bonds significantly outperformed this week. The yields on 10-year Treasury bonds dropped by over 25 basis points, the largest weekly decline since March. Hedge funds, which were heavily short on bonds nearing their all-time high, were forced to cover their positions. The U.S. Treasury signaled on Wednesday its intention to slow the pace of quarterly debt sales, tempering concerns about an increase in the supply of government bonds. The dollar declined, marking its worst three-day drop of the year. After a couple of exciting weeks, cryptocurrencies were relatively calm, with Bitcoin fluctuating between $34,000 and $36,000. Gold held above $2,000 while oil dropped below $81. Turning point OR dead cat bounce? After entering contraction territory, the S&P 500 registered its best week of 2023. At the same time, bond yields, among the main drivers of the recent stock decline, decreased. Is this the beginning of something bigger? For weeks now, stocks and bonds have moved hand in hand. The 90-day correlation between the SPDRS and P500 ETF Trust, SPY, and the iShares 20-plus year Treasury Bond ETF, TLT, is now at its highest levels since 2005. This has posed challenges for the traditional 60-40ths portfolio, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. For investors seeking to know if this is a dead cat bounce for stocks, there are signals to read. This year has been full of touch-and-go rallies that have not been confirmed by market breadth. Even this time, overall stock participation isn't favoring the rise. However, Thursday saw ANYSE buy volume of 9 to 1, nine times more rise than fall. Yet, this isn't enough to say that real buyers are showing up. If purchases don't continue but many net sales do, that tells you what you need to know. There's still supply out there, and all purchases were likely more of a short covering nature. It's worth noting that even after this week's rally, the relative performance of stocks against bonds experienced its biggest disruption of the year. Can stocks continue to outperform bonds? If rate cuts happen, they might only occur for reasons potentially favoring bonds over stocks. Ian Harnett of Absolute Strategy Research highlighted how the unemployment rate is inversely correlated with stock performance against bonds. When it drops, stocks outperform bonds. When it rises, bonds win, often rather strongly. If you have a strong conviction about the direction of the economy, then you already know what to prefer. Recession looms over the Eurozone Recession looms over the Eurozone. The economy contracted by 0.1% in the third quarter. Even seemingly good news, like slowing inflation, merely illustrates how quickly prospects are deteriorating. According to preliminary estimates, October's consumer prices increased by 2.9%, the slowest pace since Russia invaded Ukraine and down from September's 4.3%. Higher rates for longer is the current mantra for global central banks, but soon the ECB, European Central Bank, might realize its tightening cycle has gone too far. After eight years of negative rates, a 450 basis point tightening in just over a year is showing its effects. 
monetary tightening isn't just about rate hikes. The ECB has reduced its balance sheet by 20% in less than a year and has also withdrawn loans to commercial banks and stopped paying interest on their reserves. The governing council is firmly convinced that they aren't ready to consider reducing financing costs, with core inflation still more than double the 2% target. However, money market futures have fully priced in the first rate cut in April of next year. It's challenging to be optimistic about economic recovery prospects. The Eurozone's manufacturing sector is firmly in contraction territory, with an October PMI reading at 43. The services sector PMI at 47.8 is also below the growth line of 50. Money supply aggregates have all turned negative. There are countries showing some growth, such as Spain and Belgium, but countries like Ireland, the Netherlands, and Austria are already in recession or very close. Third quarter earnings for European companies highlight the economic disparity with the United States. According to JP Morgan Chase analysts, with almost half of the Euro stock's 600 companies having reported results so far, 57% have beaten estimates. Earnings per share are down by 8% on an annual basis. The S&P 500 scenario is significantly better. 78% of companies have surpassed expectations, and the average EPS has grown by 12%. What is the unemployment rate indicating? Employment growth in the United States has slowed more than expected. Non-farm payrolls increased by 150,000 in October, and the readings for the previous two months were revised downwards. The strong demand for workers is starting to cool off. The employment report consists of two surveys, the Household Survey and the Establishment Survey. Although both showed signs of weakening, the Household Survey was particularly concerning, due to increasing unemployment, declining participation, and a decrease in the number of employed workers. The unemployment rate rose to 3.9%, the highest level in the past two years. The increase indicates a resurgence in layoffs, a development that employers had previously avoided. Last month's increase in the unemployment rate suggests that unemployment is close to triggering the so-called SOM rule, which in the past has proven to be a reliable predictor of recessions. The rule, created by former Federal Reserve economist Claudia Som, assumes the onset of a recession when the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate increases by half a percentage point or more from its low of the previous 12 months. The low for unemployment so far this year has been 3.4%. In a post on X, the social media platform previously known as Twitter, Som stated that last month's unemployment increase is not good news. But she added that the Som rule hasn't triggered, nor is it on the verge of triggering. Looking ahead, continued setbacks in the labor market, the foundation of consumer spending and the economy in general, risk raising concerns about the nation's ability to withstand high interest rates without falling into a recession.